and I'm the chair of the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. I am honored to be joined by my colleagues, Councillors Josh Zakum and Matt O'Malley, and I think others will float in and out as well. We are here for a public hearing on docket number 0173, order for a hearing regarding Boston's resident parking permit program. This public hearing is being recorded and broadcast live on channels Comcast 8, RCN 82 and Verizon 1964 and webcast on the City of Boston's website. So please silence your cell phones and other devices and if you are interested in providing public testimony, um, make sure that you've signed in on the sheets next to that column and checked the appropriate boxes. Um, we are joined by a, a panel of experts representing both the City of Boston as well as um, advocates and organizations that have done a lot of work thinking about parking policy and parking management. Um, I want to provide an opportunity for uh, my colleagues to make any statements before we start and then, um, and then I'll turn it over to, to you all. Councillor Zakum? Yeah. Councillor O'Malley? I'm good, thanks. Okay. So I'll just say overall the um, push is to make sure that we're having the conversation, thinking about the opportunity to both um, improve the day-to-day -day experience in terms of our, our residential streets as well as the potential for um, resources that would go to fund much needed infrastructure improvements. Um, for me, that starts from a place of data, so I think as, as you're making your opening statements, we'd love to hear what data is available and we'll get into more questions about that, um, but lots of different models exist for how other cities are managing their parking and getting at a better um, system that more closely matches the supply with the demand and again um, helps to, to think about the resources needed for the overall transportation system. Uh, but Chief Osgood, would you like to start? Your uh, attention to this issue and I completely agree with uh, your comments that um, what we really are focused on here is, is mobility, how we actually help people uh, throughout all of our neighborhoods connect to the opportunities across this region. Uh, I'm joined by Commissioner Fiandaka and Steve McGuire, um, who I would certainly say are the experts and not me from the city side on, on this, but I wanted to do three quick things. Um, one is just give a little bit of sort of context for RPP, for resident permit parking. We will often refer uh, to resident permit parking as RPP. I apologize if we slip into that acronym. Um, second, talk a little bit about the sorts of resident permit parking um, or neighborhood parking issues that uh, we hear a lot of or quite frequently uh, from residents, uh, things they want us to change or improve about the way in which we manage parking. Uh, and then third, talk about some of the efforts that BTD is largely leading around uh, improving the parking experience in the city of Boston. Um, so first, sort of on the background around resident permit parking, um, I thought it would be useful to start with just get a sense of uh, car ownership trends uh, within the city of Boston and our households here. So. Um, the Boston Planning and Development uh, Agency uh, put out uh, a summary of sort of neighborhood statistics uh, based upon American com Community Survey data. Uh, from that, uh, from the ACS data, they see that roughly a third of the households in the city of Boston uh, don't have any cars, uh, don't have a car for that household. Uh, roughly 45% of the households in the city of Boston have one car. Uh, roughly 17% of the households in the city of Boston uh, have two cars, and 5% of the households in the city of Boston uh, have three or more vehicles. These numbers um, uh, vary uh, fairly significantly across the city of Boston, uh, and actually, in particular, probably between both Councillor O'Malley's district and Councillor Zakem's district, there's a pretty significant difference uh, in sort of car ownership rates uh, in, in clusters in the city. Um, we design, uh, the Transportation Department designs essentially resident permit parking plans in collaboration with residents based upon residents' requests, um, identifying what blocks should be posted for resident permit parking only, um, and th those tend to be uh, in some neighborhoods around things like mass transit areas, in other parts of the city, uh, it is almost every single block has some form of, of RPP, or resident permit parking program. Um, Across the city, there's around 240,000 vehicles that are associated with the household. Um, however, there's roughly 100,000 resident permit parking stickers. Again, that's because uh, in many neighborhoods in the city, there's actually very few streets that are posted for resident permit parking, so there's actually not that demand in some neighborhoods. Uh, what we see is that roughly 75% of uh, all the resident permit parking stickers are in one of six neighborhoods. Um, so Alston Brighton is the highest um, with I believe around 17%, um, South Boston, East Boston, South End, Charlestown and the Back Bay by numbers uh, have, um, 
have sort of the percentage. So again, those six neighborhoods uh, really comprise roughly 75% of all of the resident permit parking uh, stickers that we actually issue. Um, there are certainly neighborhoods which I did not name there, uh, places like the North End or Beacon Hill that have high numbers of uh, high demand for resident permit parking, but the aggregate number is less than those other neighborhoods. Um, where we see sort of lower numbers is, gen is generally places where uh, the on-street demand for parking is less simply because there's more available uh, curb space or driveways or uh, what have you where there's not a need for RPP stickers or RPP uh, programs on streets. Um, we hear uh, across the city, uh, Commissioner Steve uh, Carla Tankel is here, uh, hears all the time from residents and from each of you about ways in which we might be able to think about managing um, city's rules and regulations on parking differently. Uh, that's everything from thinking about how we uh, support uh, home health care workers um, to how we provide things like uh, visitor passes for people who are perhaps in a zero uh, car household but want to be able to have an RPP opportunity for somebody who's coming to visit them. Um, we are increasingly uh, and understandably getting requests for things like more space in residential areas for package pickup and drop off, for TNC pickup and drop off, taxi pickup and drop off. Uh, and certainly we've got a collective interest in thinking about how we use our curb for things like dedicated bus lanes, dedicated bike lanes, uh, wider sidewalks, et cetera. Um, with all of those uh, pressures on the very valuable real estate of our street, there's a lot of things, and again, that BTD is, is uh, leading on, which are about making the parking experience uh, more convenient and better managed uh, and uh, ultimately uh, less needed. Um, so in that sort of category of, uh, of uh, more convenient with the council's support, uh, the transportation department was able to uh, replace all of the parking meters in the city of Boston with new parking meters and launch a very successful uh, uh, app, Park Boston, uh, a couple of years ago. More recently, uh, um, over the last few weeks, uh, the council has similarly been supportive of um, a terrific effort to uh, support the mayor's budget um, for FY19. Uh, and as part of that overall package, it included a tool for us that's going to help us better manage resident permit parking. Um, we are increasing the fines from for resident permit parking from $40 uh, to $60. Um, we get a tremendous number of requests um, for, through 311 uh, for people to go out and enforce resident permit parking in our neighborhoods. Uh, we issue roughly 190,000 tickets every year um, uh, to actually uh, sort of address these concerns that residents raise. Um, I would say that uh, our, our biggest efforts though really are sort of holistic efforts to think about how we help people move in ways that doesn't require either uh, sort of uh, you know, car ownership or second car ownership um, and can shift them to uh, modes of transit that are uh, that in the end could potentially cost less, cause less congestion, and uh, cause fewer emissions. Uh, and a lot of those things are things which are programs that you have been uh, very supportive of and know uh, quite well. Things like the Drive Boston program, which is a, essentially a car sharing program. Uh, there's been some great research by uh, Professor Susan Shaheen out of UC Berkeley that has identified the impact that car share has on reducing uh, car ownership. Uh, for every car share vehicle that uh, is out there, her research shows that roughly uh, nine vehicles are either uh, not purchased in the first place, uh, the purchase is deferred, uh, or a car is actually shed. So it's a way that you can actually free up some uh, resident parking by adding car share uh, spaces uh, in the city. Similarly, uh, there are lots of uh, uh, folks who use a car because it is uh, the only way they can actually get from point A to point B. And one of those uh, reasons is that uh, our mass transit system does not operate 24-7. We have been working very hard, and the mayor has uh, been uh, championing an effort and working with MassDOT to expand both early morning hours and late night hours. Uh, so this past April, um, uh, MassDOT started early morning hour service on a couple of key bus routes, which again will help people who uh, perhaps are car dependent today to be able to get to work uh, more easily uh, without a car in the future. Similarly, uh, MassDOT is, is supporting uh, efforts to extend some key routes uh, late at night to be able to provide greater coverage and again allow people not to have to own a car, not to have uh, uh, if they don't uh, if they don't want to in the first place. Um, there's additional work that we are doing, obviously, and uh, many of you are, are quite familiar and been uh, great champions of uh, around things like helping transit just work better in our city. This includes things like uh, the bus lane on Washington Street through Roslindale, uh, and then uh, similarly, there are sort of other modes that we are uh, uh, very excited to be uh, supporting. Things like the expansion of uh, our bike share system uh, to more areas in the city, uh, and through the transportation department's uh, good work, we will be expanding that by roughly 50% over the course of this next year and getting reaching more neighborhoods and higher density within existing neighborhoods. Um, so that was the, the intent, sorry for that long-winded overview, but that was, the intent was sort of to lay a little bit of a foundation around <coughs> parking trends and the RPP program we have in the city of Boston, talk a little bit about the wide variety of 
of interest that residents have in our neighborhoods, and then uh, touch on uh, what I think is sort of the broader strategy for how we think, uh, we think about not only managing parking, but uh, helping to relieve some of the parking pressure that we're experiencing in the city. Did I miss it? Okay. Right. Thank you, Chief. Commissioner? Yep. Would you like to add anything? Okay. Director, good. Okay. So maybe if we could take opening statements from our three sort of advocate side and um, academic side participants, and then that way counselors can direct questions at whomever they, they wish to learn from. Great. Andrew, do you want to start? Yeah, of course. Um, good afternoon. My name is Andrew McFarland. I'm the Community Engagement Manager for Livable Streets Alliance. Uh, we're a, a transportation advocacy nonprofit um, that works to make communities throughout Greater Boston more walkable, um, bike friendly, and transit oriented. Um, today, I'm also speaking on behalf of our advocacy partners, Walk Boston and the Boston Cyclists Union. Um, I want to thank the Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation for holding this hearing and to thank um, Councillor Wu for sponsoring it. Um, my message today is that our current system for managing parking is not effectively serving our city. And in many ways, it's exacerbating the existing inequities and challenges at a time when Boston is experiencing unprecedented growth. Curb space is one of our most valuable public resources but that's not reflected in the way that we manage it. When parking is free or undervalued, drivers still pay through congestion, frustration, and untold hours circling the block for a free space. According to the, um, the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics Performance Parking Pilot um, report, uh, an estimated 30% of street traffic in Boston is caused by drivers who are circling the block looking for a uh, parking space. We have better models for managing shared resources. In contrast, we acknowledge that access to clean drinking water is a public service, but we still charge property owners um, for how much water they use. I encourage the City Council to uh, see parking management reform as a way to safeguard a valuable resource in order to provide drivers with more access and some much needed relief. The good news is that we do have tools to address this problem now. Uh, first, I think it's important to acknowledge the limits of today's residential parking system. First, our residential system provides more permits than there are spaces available, presenting the misleading notion that a permit guarantees you the right to a parking space. Today, we do not have a cap on how many permits the city gives out, despite the fact that we have only a limited number of spaces available. For example, it's been estimated that there are 4,000 parking permits in effect in the North End, but only 1,500 spaces exist. Without a limit, the number of permits will continue to go unchecked, and in the last 10 years alone, the number of permits has increased by 25%. The current system also incentivizes car, private car storage on public streets, which contributes to the overall shortage of available resources. Um, according to a Boston Globe article from 2015, more than 300 households in Boston still have, have more than five uh, cars registered to them. We have no limits for how many cars can be registered per, health, per household, and there's no fee in place to curb that, this usage. Um, Somerville, Cambridge, and Quincy all set some fee for residential permits, and Brookline has strict limits on overnight street parking. These approaches have made it easier for these communities to better meet their parking needs, and in Somerville, better parking management for residents has allowed the city to create parking programs tailored to visitors, small business owners, and home health care aides. The current system also hasn't kept pace with the increases in population or changes in transportation patterns. The last time our residential permit system was reformed was in the 1980s when the city's population was at a historic low of um, around uh, 563,000 uh, 500, uh, residents. Um, since 1980, the Boston has added uh, nearly 100,000 residents, and by 2030, it's projected that we'll be adding an additional 50,000 residents and um, 100,000 jobs in the area. The current system also doesn't acknowledge the need for um, people with disabilities or seniors. Unlike our neighbors in Cambridge and Somerville, we do not have equity-based programs to prioritize the needs of our seniors or people with disabilities, many of whom depend upon vehicles for basic mobility needs. The current system also does not, the current system places the onus on neighbors to self-organize. I think this point is really important. Under the current system, a permit pr uh, process is initiated by the residents themselves and requires them to collect signatures from at least 51% of adults who live on that affected street. Um, in asking neighbors to self-organize through the system, neighborhoods with resources and time have an advantage which only perpetuates systemic inequities. Um, for example, despite having a population of nearly 60,000 people, Roxbury only has 900 permits in effect. Um, compared to Brighton, which has around 44,000 residents and about 10,000 permits, 
or South Boston, which has a population of 35,000 and 19,000 permits. The current system does not balance the needs of people who are um, parking near rapid transit stations and residents who live in those neighborhoods. Uh, for example, take my street. I live on Danforth Street in Jamaica Plain, a block away from the Stony Brook Tea Station. Um, there are no parking regulations for um, neighborhood permits in effect. Um, at 6 a.m., about a third of the parking spaces are typically taken, um, but as 9 o'clock rolls around, those spaces are taken up by commuters who park and then walk over to the Orange Line. Uh, this has also been an underlying issue with the Rosendale bus pilot on Washington Street. Thanks to the research led by MAPC, we learned that 45% of parking spaces along Washington Street between Forest Hills and Rosendale Square were being used primarily during work hours for cars registered in Dedham, Randolph, and other outside communities who are trying to access Forest Hill Station. Um, cities like Seattle have developed programs to address both the need for commuter parking and, and the, um, the need for residential permit parking. Um, and we can do that here in Boston. Given all this, we needed to take some early steps to alleviate the stress Boston residents are experiencing on their streets. Um, Catherine from Better City and, and Mark will go into that a little bit more, um, so I'll leave that to them. But I, I do want to stress some early action steps that the city could take at this time. First, we need to know um, how many spaces we have available. The city should conduct a parking census and establish a, a citywide cap on residential permits. Plain and simple, we shouldn't be giving out more permits than are available in neighborhoods. Second, take the onus off of residents and establish clear policies for where residential permits should be in place and how that should, be, how that should contribute to our transportation networks. The current patchwork approach to permits covers some streets but leaves others out. Let's not wait for residents to self-organize. If, if we know that a street should be covered um, by neighborhood permit zone, then the city should make it so. Third, start charging graduated fees for residential permits. A household of five or more cars shouldn't necessarily be prevented from getting access to permits, but they should be charged for the toll that they're taking um, when it comes to taking away parking on their neighborhood streets. Um, it's important to know that car ownership itself in Boston is not equitable. The households with multiple cars are some of the wealthiest in the city. According to Go Boston 2030, among households with no vehicles, more than half have annual incomes of less than $25,000 a year. Um, Oh, only 7% of zero vehicle households make over $100,000. In, in beginning to charge fees, we should uh, create equity exemptions for um, seniors and people with disabilities as well. Uh, finally, um, let's consider reforms uh, for metered parking spaces as well. Um, our parking system doesn't exist in isolated neighborhood zones. With Main Streets, we should discuss potential partnerships for piloting and establishing parking benefit dis districts. Um, we should also, we also currently do not have clear policies for installing new parking meters and currently meters are concentrated in a handful of downtown neighborhoods um, and less so out in outlying neighborhoods. Um, finally, um, we should be expanding the newer mechanics performance parking pilot beyond the back bay. In reforming our parking uh, permit system, we can make serious progress that alleviates uh, residents' transportation stress. Better management means less time wasted searching for available space and more parking available over time. Since Cambridge instituted uh, parking permit fees, there has been a steady decline in the number of people applying for permits over a period of 10 years, even when that pop the city has seen increased population growth. Um, with better managed parking, we can find new opportunities for getting more people moving on our streets. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank oh, you. sorry, before you start, I, I want to make sure to recognize my colleagues who have joined us um, since Councillor Anissa Sabi George, Councillor Kim Janey, Councillor Ed Flynn, and Councillor Lydia Edwards, too. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wu, members of the Council. Um, we appreciate your holding this hearing to discuss um, important and necessary parking system reforms. Um, my name is Catherine Carlson. I am the Director of Transportation at A Better City. And on behalf of our 130 member businesses and institutions, I appreciate the opportunity to address you today and share some of our research and work that we've done on this topic. Um, we're all here because parking issues are a significant part of the overall transportation challenge facing Boston. Um, in late 2016, A Better City, working with uh, the BTD, uh, Commissioner Fiandaka wrote a wonderful uh, welcome letter for this report. The Barr Foundation, MAPC, Masco, and others released a comprehensive study entitled The Future of Parking in Boston, addressing the need to promote economic opportunity, enhance community access, and reduce parking demand. I brought a prop. I can get all of you one of these if you don't already have it on your desk, which I'm sure you do. Um, 
We undertook this report because parking policy affects the livelihood of Bostonians, the success of businesses, and the health of our environment. This report laid out a new framework for addressing parking holistically in Boston, and I do urge you to consider using it as a guide. In fact, the city, um, as they were a part of this report, has um, taken some of these recommendations to heart. And uh, we thank you and applaud your efforts on addressing some of the recommendations and your initial efforts to implement best practices, such as smart metering and increased penalties that work to op optimize the use of valuable curb curbside space. And I think you'll probably hear a lot of um, overlap in what Andrew, Mark, and I are all saying today, but I really want to focus on this idea of valuable curbside space. Um, in order to effectively tackle parking, both residential and commercial, and its place within our overall transportation system, we actually need to understand and have a conversation about the value of curb space. In a city of rising congestion and rents, the value of this space and the parking spots alongside it are not zero. I, I know everyone knows that, um, but I think this is an important thing that we should, we should all talk a lot more about. The first step is recognizing that value, and the next step is determining what our goals are for that space. This valuable real estate can serve as automobile storage for long periods of time, for short periods of time. It can provide access to homes and businesses. It can serve commercial purposes, such as delivery space. And it can also serve as a space for multi multiple modes of transportation, like bus lanes or biking. The continued underpricing of on-street space means this valuable resource is misallocated to what may not always be the highest and best use. For example, automobile storage versus mobility or commercial opportunity. Furthermore, the disparity that these policies create between on-street and off-street parking prices and the enforcement fines therein encourages high demand for this limited on-street parking space. This harms residents with mobility challenges and businesses who need their customers to have easier access to their locations. It discourages travel by other modes, which thereby increases congestion and creates problems in adverse weather conditions, and it removes space for commercial and active mobility uses. We have begun to try to improve curb management through more accurate pricing in metered parking areas. And I know Chris mentioned this and Andrew mentioned this. One of the goals of demand-based meter pricing is to ensure that there is always an availability of on-street parking, which can be essential to local businesses, with every metered space serving the customers that are essential to their vitality. When spaces are not available or do not turn over, businesses suffer. Furthermore, within a construct of a parking benefit district, local businesses and Main Street organizations can use meter revenue to make improvements in their districts. And more and more research is showing that improved visibility and increased foot traffic are keys to increase, increasing Main Street business revenue. In all of these ways, smarter curb management will help Boston's merchants and employers. But for the purposes of discussion today, I want to highlight some key conclusions and recommendations as it rel relates specifically to the residential parking permit program on street parking and the goal of improving residential neighborhoods. And again, you're gonna um, hear me echo a lot of what Andrew um, has said as well. I think first and foremost, and I know the city is, is beginning um, this work, which is to invest in data for better management. Um, as was already noted, complete a complete full on-street parking inventory does not yet exist. In our report, The Future of Parking, we did provide an initial attempt at an off-street parking census. Updating that inventory and adding on-street parking data is necessary for efforts to manage the system and to innovate. Number two, we do recommend, and as the report um, suggested, we recommend exploring a fee-based residential parking permit program. This could happen in multiple ways. Uh, what we had laid out in this report from a few years ago is that you adopt an escalating residential par parking permit fee per household. So for example, like our neighboring towns of Cambridge or Somerville, it could be $25 for the first car, 50 for the second, 100 for the third, and so on. Um, these, these fees are, they may not be behavior changing immediately, we understand that. These are, um, and they are definitely not market clearing fees. Um, but as Andrew actually pointed out, Somerville has seen a decrease since instituting it in the number of permits applied for. It also starts to change the value judgment of, of residents and visitors on, on what this, this space is worth. And that in and of itself, I think, is a worthwhile goal. 
Um, other ways to um, imp institute a fee while also helping residents is to extend hybrid RPP areas to overlap into commercial districts during times of lower demand. You could allow noun permit holders to park in some RPP zones if and only when resident demand is low, so a little bit more sharing of those permit spaces. Um, again, as others have mentioned, add meters in some missed Use, mixed use neighborhoods where, with permit holders exempt from some of these meters. Um, an interesting idea that came up in this report was to help broker shared parking agreements, which would open up underutilized facilities for residents with permits, such as in overnight parking garages in nearby office garages. As I think um, Chris had mentioned, uh, we have 380,000, according to, to our report, we have 380,000 um, off-street parking spots, 240,000 residential cars in Boston, and 100,000 residential permits. So there are spots, ostensibly, if those numbers are right, there are spots for all those cars off-street at certain points of, of time. So I think that would be something interesting to explore. And finally, and I think incredibly importantly, dedicate these permit fees and fines, one, of course, to covering the program's administrative costs and to fund increased enforcement. But with the surplus revenue, you can use, um, it can be used in, in parking improvement districts or um, just for the neighborhoods uh, to use for street side improvements, snow removal, sidewalk repairs. Funds could also be used to provide parking or transit subsidies to low income residents, helping address some equity issues we have, and could also fund rewards for car free households who right now are ostensibly subsidizing the use of some of that space. Um, finally, outreach um, is incredibly important. We understand that changing long-held policies is difficult and that this will require, require somewhat of a cultural shift in how we view on-street resources. It will be necessary for all of us um, to help guide and, and, and inform um, residents with the data we're collecting on the costs and benefits of our PP residential par parking permit fee programs and to gain the support of those stakeholders. But despite those implementation challenges, uh, we think the benefits are clear. Better valuing and managing of this public space will yield multiple benefits, including dedicated revenue for neighborhood improvements, commercial loading access that can mitigate congestion and improve air quality, and flexibility of on-street spaces that you can, you know, you can flex curbside space for residential needs, valet parking, peak hour bus or bike lanes, parklets, outdoor dining, and more. Um, we are encouraged by the focus that the council and the city are placing on this issue. Thank you. We understand that this is just a first step in a long conversation, and we are happy to be here and to provide research and support that will help move us toward a more equitable and sustainable parking program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, last but not least, Professor Chase, and thank you both for participating in the Council's policy briefing series. Previously, I learned so much from that, and also that you're going overseas as part of a class on transportation-related stuff tomorrow, so thank you for taking the time to, to be here when you should be packing. <laughs> well, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's very exciting to see Boston looking at managing parking better. I think not a lot of cities do it well, and especially not a lot of big cities, so it's exciting, and I think, you know, I hope you all embrace it as a, as a chance to be a leader and to make lives easier for your residents. One thing that hasn't been talked about with parking is as you have on-street parking and as you have problems with on-street parking, the pressure is to have people park off-street, and <laughs> essentially then, you're asking developers to, to build more parking, which then increases the cost of housing because essentially parking is not free to build. It constrains what you can build because if you talk to architects, they're gonna tell you parking is the first thing we look at before we even design the building. How much parking is on this plot? And I think by solving the on-street parking problem, you unlock the off-street problem and that people don't have to build as much because as a neighbor, you're of course frustrated when somebody builds and they don't have parking when there's a terrible problem on street, but you can solve the problem on street. And the other side is the more parking you have, the more traffic you have. So if you ask developers to build a lot more parking, then if you had no road congestion, that would be fine. But when you have road congestion, you're asking people to build parking where you're putting more cars on the roads and that's not a good situation. Um, I didn't talk much about myself. I teach at Tufts. I was uh, on the senior staff of Zipcar in the very early days and, and working with the city of Boston back then and uh, the MBTA and other cities to, to place Zipcars. And I think there are so many options now that didn't exist the last time you looked at, at parking permits. 
Um, the system's clearly broken, and the one way you can tell it's broken is by looking on Craigslist. They have a section on Craigslist for parking. And I took a look this morning. If you live in South Boston, you can rent an off-street space on Craigslist for $345 a month. So add that to 12. I'm not a great math person, but it's over $3,500 a year for a parking spot in South Boston off-street. <coughs> So essentially the city, if I had a parking spot in South Boston, the smartest thing I could do would be to rent that parking spot and put my car on street. And that's just a broken system. So that's why we need to get not issuing too many permits so people can park on street. And the other thing is potentially and hopefully getting towards what I would call the right price for parking and in your head. The right price for an off-street parking now when there's so much congestion is $345 in South Boston. I'm not saying charge that. I'm saying charge the price where there's always a few spaces available. And it may take you a while to get there. I'll tell you a little story about MIT. When I was at Zipcar in 2000, a parking space was about $250. They told the faculty every year we're going to raise the price by 10% because that spot that we're giving you for $250 a year is costing us 2,500 a year to give you. And so they're losing 2,500, $2,200 on every parking spot. They raise their fees 10% every year. That's like the frog in the slowly boiling water. That doesn't scare people because the next year it's 220, the next year it's 240, but that adds up and eventually you get to the right price. And I think that's a political model that you want to think about, which is get to a, a price that people can accept now that gets people to use their driveways instead of parking on street. And then get that spot to where when you get a permit, you know you're going to get a space and you don't have a waiting list to get that space. You have the right price for a permit. Because I think you should start with waiting lists because that way people will, people who have cars who live in Boston now will have a, a place to park and they're not going to lose that. But new people who come to Boston will be on a waiting list. Now, you might have equity things where if you're low income or you're a senior, a low income senior, you get, you get moved to the front of the line because it's more important for you than somebody who has enough money to rent a Craigslist space. So those are, those are really my only thoughts. It's, it's what we call the, the Goldilocks principle, get the, get the price right, try not to issue too many permits. Um, the, the ace in the hole, the thing that you have that is so powerful, is that parking generates a tremendous amount of revenue. And I don't know, obviously, if you have crunched those numbers on what revenue can look like. Obviously, that could be seen as a new tax. I see it as an opportunity to share that money with the people who might be hurt by this to make them feel better about it. Like, put some of that money back in the neighborhoods. If you're familiar with participatory budgeting, people in the neighborhoods put forward ideas, people vote on it, and then they get to see that built, their ideas actually get funded. And parking could help fund participatory budgeting. You could name it something nice. I like Neighborhood Imagination Fund. What could you imagine in your neighborhood that parking could pay for? Um, and a parking benefit district that Catherine mentioned I think is very important. Um, with that, I'm, I'm going to stop. I'm, I'm not sure if we'll ever get a chance for questions. I'm happy to answer questions either now or via email or when I get back. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'll, I'll turn it over to my colleagues for questions of anyone, um, starting with Councillor Josh Sakem. Thank you. Chair, uh, thank you to our panel uh, for being here. And thank you for calling this hearing. Uh, it's important as representing uh, many of the downtown neighborhoods living in Back Bay, myself. Uh, parking in general uh, and traffic management in general are uh, some of the number one concerns for me, both as a resident and as someone who represents uh, many of the downtown residents. Um, Chris, when you, you start off talking about uh, curbside uses and reallocating that, yep. um, that's something that comes up all, all the time. time. I would say particularly in Back Bay, particularly given our recent uh, redesign of Beacon Street. Um, and I think certainly raising the fines for double parking will address some of that, but it's not going to address uh, ride sharing or deliveries. Um, I can't imagine it will. I would hope it would, but it probably won't. What are we doing in concrete terms, and is there a timeline to say whether we're talking about doing some sort of loading area on every block, every two blocks? I mean, whether it's, you know, yep. it could be UPS, it could be Amazon, it could be, was it Uber Eats? Um, I mean, it, 
anything coming delivering this is obviously happening everywhere what, what what's going on what can we do uh, it's a, I certainly agree and I imagine that Martin Roeder who I think is also here oh, will probably echo yeah. uh, these comments as, as well from uh, the neighborhood association of the back bay clearly uh, on Beacon Street and across our city there's more of that need we did design a couple of spaces along the redesigned Beacon Street but we've heard clearly from uh, from NAB and others there's a desire for more places for pick up and drop off I would say the a short-term thing which we're doing and you may know the timeline better than, than, than I do, is specific around TNC pickup and drop off. Mm -hmm. um, we are gonna be working with TNCs, uh, including a place in the back bay to figure out how do we actually direct them to a particular spot in the curb that we can mm -hmm. keep clear for, for them. And I think we also need to find more spaces for some of those sort of residential uh, delivery. And we, have, uh, and we can look at more spaces along the Beacon Street <coughs> corridor to restrict <coughs> those for that purpose. Because I, I read uh, in Washington, D.C., and I'm sure other cities are doing this, that they've used it in their sort of nightlife district. I think the blocks and blocks are just TNC only or cabs. I'm yes. sure that it's cabs or, or ride share. Um, now, I don't think that there's a need in Back Bay for that extent of it, um, but obviously it would have to be coupled with enforcement um, and significant, and maybe we have to do the home rule process uh, to increase those, those enforcement penalties. But I think from an issue of congestion and also, you know, using the parking, it's something we really need to look at. Um, and I think especially when we're asking people in our neighborhoods to sit through and to deal with reconfigured streets, I think people, you know, as we remember from our meetings on that front um, a year ago for Beacon Street in particular, there was a very strong willingness from the neighborhood to do that. But we have to, I think, then be cognizant of the fact that we went from three lanes to essentially one on Beacon Street because the second lane is often double parked. So I won't, I won't belabor the point, but I think that we, we need to have a plan and a timeline for what we're doing, um, whether it's ride share, whether it's deliveries or a combination thereof. Um, probably every block, um, at least I would say in Back Bay, um, other neighborhoods I think, and you know, certainly Councilor Flynn who represents some similar, uh, similarly populous uh, or dense neighborhoods um, might have issues on that as well. Um, we're talking about meter rate increases. Back Bay also has been part of the pilot right. program. Um, and we're talking about resident parking here um, and adjusting it. Something that I hear a lot from my neighbors is that while they are, I wouldn't say happy with the pilot program, they are willing to acknowledge it's, you know, the goals and that it's an admirable, you know, willing to try it. But addressing it for, you know, you mentioned earlier a visitor parking permit. I mean, you know, it's not, even with the higher rates, it's not a huge amount of money if you're, if you're just coming in to go shopping once a month or whatever it is. But when people do have visitors, um, if they want to visit elderly relatives, and you mentioned also home health care, um, which Councilor Flaherty and I have uh, had some hearings on also, you know, I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that while acknowledging that parking is a valuable resource, we need to get our incentives in line on this. Um, you know, there, there are negative impacts on people. And, you know, are we looking at also more resident parking enforcement, particularly on Sundays? Um, that's something that uh, continues to be an issue. Are we looking at perhaps saying if you're a resident, you're going to have an adjusted rate at the meters, something like that? I mean, I, given that where technology is, and I, and I want to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, Councilor Wu, I think, very bravely has filed this and has been out front on this. Um, it is an important issue um, for all of us who live in the neighborhoods. We, I think everyone wants to move forward, both from a congestion standpoint, a safety, an environmental standpoint, but we, we need to make sure that people in our neighborhoods, you know, are, you know, able to live, you know, and, and, and handle it and not pay the, was it $350 a month um, to find a parking space. So that's something I'd like to put in the discussion. Um, I don't know, maybe some of our experts, or if you've seen it, have seen that in other cities. Um, whether it can be done through the app, whether it can be done through something else, it, it's something that I've heard a lot from folks say, listen, if you're going to charge five bucks an hour or 10 bucks an hour, whatever it is for people who are visiting, you know, we don't love it, but okay, but is there some accommodation for residents? That's something I like to just put out there. And with that, I know there's a lot, this is going to be a long hearing, so I don't want to take up any more time. I probably have gone too long already. Uh, but thank you uh, all very much for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, for having this hearing. Yes, um, one quick response, and then uh, there may be others. On, particularly on the enforcement, um, through the new budget, uh, uh, part of the 
uh, increased investment that was allowed through the fine changes, the increased investment in the Transportation Department. Uh, we will be bringing on an additional supervisor, which allows us to think about shift structure. We know certainly we get lots of requests uh, for parking enforcement, to your point, on right. Sundays. So we will have more of that capacity to have a, a, a close to 24-7 or 24-7 uh, parking enforcement structure. Um, and I think that I mean, there are each of these trade-offs. How do we add more visitor parking? How do we... Uh, there, no. We are still working through some of those. The new meters that we did put in, again, with the council support, do allow for uh, some things like parking validation, potentially. Um, mm. So we may be able to look at some things like that. But uh, we have not, to the best of my knowledge, sort of implemented any of those at this point. So. Mm. Thank you. Would anyone else like to chime in, especially on the idea of residents being exempted from commercial parking fees? Or was it the sort of hybrid model you were talking about, Catherine? Yeah. And again, I, you know, I think there are a lot of ways you could structure that. It could be always. It could be at low demand times. It could be on a, a visitor permit basis. So, um, you know, I think that's probably a whole conversation in and of itself. But there are lots of ways to do that. I think I would add that the enforcement is obviously key when the system is broken. But one of the data <laughs> points that you should watch for that worked well in San Francisco was as their system got better, enforcement revenues went down. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very popular thing because people don't like getting tickets. Obviously, when the system's broken, ticketing is the way to, to get turnover and to get curb space. But when you get your, your, your signals right, and that might take a few years, you know, kind of start with the small, easy things. but you'll see the enforcement revenue go down, and I think that's part of the data that will make merchants happy because their customers aren't getting tickets and residents happy that their visitors aren't getting tickets. TNCs, I don't have any sympathy for them, but not right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. You're a good, Councilor Zakem? Thank you. Councilor Sabi George. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for being here. Um, have we, have you studied or looked at that sweet spot for the pricing structure, is it a one number citywide or is it um, depend on which neighborhood and sort of what zone someone might be in uh, for a uh, residential sticker? We have not, but I think you're absolutely right that it would, uh, to Mark's point, it would be variable. Across the city. Yeah. And then what about, on, on some of the uh, neighborhood, I'm sorry, I have a cold, so it's, I don't know if it's cold or allergies, whatever it is, it's clogging the brain. Um, the restricted times for neighborhood parking now across the city is um, variable across neighborhood, but yes. even within neighborhoods, it is variable. Have we, or could we at least sort of simplify that process? And I get that one neighborhood is different than another depending on you know, proximity to a transit, um, transportation, proximity to whatever. But just some simplification of that would be, I think, a, a good thing across the city. Uh, well, Councilor, what we normally do is we work with our community groups when we craft a program to see what problem are we solving. Um, generally, when, when neighborhood groups come to us and they request a resident permit program, it's because folks are coming in from outside of their neighborhood and taking up those parking spaces. Sometimes it's uh, near a transit hub, sometimes it's near a commercial district, um, and sometimes it's, uh, it's overnight, as in South Boston. So. Um, as much as we try to standardize the regulations, we want to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the residents. Generally, programs are in effect for daytime hours between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., and there are, are some uh, variations within that, but uh, generally that's the, the daytime program, and that would be around transit hubs for people coming in and going to work, basically. Um, or around business districts, it, it might be an extended program um, into the early evening hours, say, until 8 p.m. And then there are some areas where uh, the enforcement is basically uh, available to us 24-7, and that would be in the downtown area. And then other locations, as I said, in South Boston, which would be primarily um, 6 p.m. to 10 a.m. Right. And then what is the current collection on tickets that are written for... Um, permit violations, so not having a neighborhood sticker. Our collection rate across the board for, for parking violations is quite high, one of the highest in the country, um, at about 93%. Yes. Um, 
So uh, part of that is a credit well, what's that to- What's in dollar amounts? How much, how much did we collect either if we know the FY18 number or the FY17 number in residential ticket or permit violations? Um, I don't have the actual number. I, I, have a, I do have a number here. It's basically um, uh, close to a million dollars, nine. Oh, those were uh, through February. For F so. Through February for yeah. calendar year 18 through the current date, um, just shy of a million. And uh, generally for calendar year 17, um, it would be close to $8 million total. Yeah. And that's based on um, approximately 1.3 million parking tickets issued in the city of Boston across all violations and uh, parking ticket revenue in the neighborhood of $62 million. Right. So that's the, that, to put it in some context, Councilor. Thank you. And then um, one of the concerns that's come up is some of the violations that valet services have in front of their, the establishments that they're working for. But there are, I mean, there's a number of violations that they, they've committed. Uh, but one of them is they'll take that car and then move it and park it on another street, on another public parking spot. Yes. And is there a way to manage that or what's the fine structure for that? Because my understanding mm -hmm. is if you have valet services for an establishment, yes. that you've got some sort of contracted lot that you're bringing those vehicles to. Yeah. That, that's correct. Um, the Transportation Department does manage the valet permit parking program. Um, part of the provisions of their license is that they must contract with an off-street parking facility and provide us um, with the location of that facility as well as the, um, uh, the travel pattern that they will take to get from the parking spot to the parking facility. Uh, we do have enforcement officers um, as well as a BPD officer assigned to transportation. Um, they will respond to um, any complaints with valet operations to make sure that those vehicles are being moved to off-street facilities and not taking up on-street spaces. Um, if that is found to be the case, there is a provision within their permit uh, guidelines that we will call them in for a hearing and we can revoke that permit if that's found to be the case. Um, very good. Uh, that's, that's good for me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sabi George. Councillor Janey? Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you to the panel. Certainly, well, are you leaving? I, I so before you leave, let me publicly <laughs> thank you. <laughs> let me at least publicly thank you. I have several questions, and I know I have the opportunity for a sit-down with you later. Yeah. Is this mic on? Yeah. Just to kind of follow up. So last week, you know, I had a, a, a meeting at, in Roxbury for residents where the chief and the commissioner and other members of your team uh, came out to really address many of the issues that, that we're talking about today. Certainly residential parking yep. came up, but there were many other issues, so I just wanted to publicly thank you, and I look forward to following up. Likewise. These are huge issues everywhere I go. Um, you know, I'm hearing issues around transportation, around yeah. safety, around residential parking, or um, just all kinds of concerns, and so that's why I held uh, that meeting and why I think that this hearing is so important. So thank you for, for holding this um, and for taking on uh, this conversation, which I know many people are in favor, many people are against. I mean, it's just one of these hot button issues. So um, I wanted to publicly thank you and thank you. Um, and thank you, Andrew, for all of your, your advocacy. It's been extremely Actually, helpful. But I just had one question. Sure, go ahead. Sorry, yes. are you, are you okay? No, go ahead. Okay. Okay. I, I just, because the, the one -on -one. I think <laughs> data has come up again and again yes. in our conversations yeah. and in Absolutely. a lot of the testimony. So are, I just wanted, the only question I had was yep. for you, Chief, was yep. are there plans for a citywide on-street parking census? How much would it cost? Does it need to go into now the next year's fiscal yep. uh, budget? So a portion of it is, is funded, it was actually funded two fiscal years ago, I want to say. So we've actually started the process, but one of the things that we've done, because we've done sort of previous parking censuses, uh, is that we wanted to create a system that actually ensured that A, the data was accurate from the start, and B, that the accurate was always, the data was always accurate going forward, that it actually would sort of update as we made adjustments on to RPP on Guild Street or whatever, whatever it might be, that that would sort of automatically happen. Uh, so uh, the first part of that work was figuring out can we actually accurately identify literally where like where signs are on the street that have parking rules on them, that is sort of where the uh, 
the foundational piece. That piece is sort of success. We, we work with a partner who can sort of accurately map where signs are, what those signs say. The second piece, which is the piece we're going through right now, is basically converting signs to rules. Um, and so this is a technical piece that they are, where they're actually, where our partner would be building or uh, will be building a, a system that can interpret, okay, if you have an RPP sign here and an RPP sign here, then the curb in between is resident permit parking and it has these certain hours. That is the piece that essentially is in front of us. Um, that then would, uh, would uh, sort of have to get integrated with our work order management system that BTD uses to actually update the signs. Um, this has been a longer process than a simple survey, but our hope is that it gives us a path so that it's not just in, we're not, we don't have to do kind of like an annual investment in a new survey of the streets, but it's, it's a permanent atlas that actually is always accurate. Um, this is something which, uh, shockingly, uh, a lot of cities still uh, are, are sort of focused on. So um, as part of uh, the commissioner's work with, with NACTA, with the National Association of City Transportation Officials, um, there are... Uh, some conversations around their shared streets data standard and if we can create essentially a data standard for parking that something like this could help inform. Similarly, there's some private, uh, large private companies uh, that are looking to do the same thing. Uh, and so we are, we are hard at work at this. Um, I, we don't need to fund something new at this point. We're sort of doing the technical piece. Um, as we expand the actual on-street survey that we may need to, we, we may need some additional funding in the future. I strongly agree though, I think we all strongly agree with the sentiment that we're really looking for better management of our curb, and if we don't have a measurement of what that is, if we don't know what our curb rules actually are comprehensively, it's a lot harder to do. So we're on a path to get there. It's just been a little what do you th What's the timeline, you think, for when yeah. the census would be done? So we hope to get to that rules engine, which is what we're calling mm -hmm. the current piece. The rules engine largely built between now and spring of next year. Then there'll be the integration piece with the actual work order management system. Well, then at that point, honestly, have a path of how quickly can we get a full sort of evergreen com uh, sort of uh, atlas of, uh, of rules in this on city streets. There are, uh, there are sort of more brute force ways that we could do this, mm -hmm. just the concern is things ch do change in parts of our city all the time and we just don't want to keep spending money over and over again doing a census. Okay. So, so, go ahead. That was actually one of my questions, just an inventory around parking, yep. how many parking spots are available on the streets, so it sounds like that's in process. Correct. I wonder though, are you also looking at uh, the off-street parking. So, you know, my observation as we look at our city, there are certain neighborhoods that have, uh, are more densely populated, yes. have triple-deckers, less parking, off-street parking available, and then there are other neighborhoods that have maybe single-family homes, yep. they have driveways, et cetera. So I'm just, I, I'd really like to have a sense of what parking is overall in our city, um, and I would never want to see, I mean, I, I guess I appreciate the entrepreneurial spirit of this person on Craigslist in South Boston renting out their parking spot, but I think that just adds to the challenges that, that we have, and mm -hmm. if people have parking, they should be using it for their own vehicles if they have vehicles as opposed to putting their cars on in the street, and so I just think it's important to include that in the mix. Yeah. I don't know if that's something that you're looking at. So actually through, and Catherine, you mm -hmm. talked more about this, uh, through our collaboration with ABC, an off-street parking census, a rough off-street parking census was done. That would be combined with the on-street parking census. It would probably be, we could do kind of a rough approximation of on-street parking, but there's a, uh, of how many potential parking spaces there are, but that doesn't help us then understand what the parking rules are, so that's a lot of our focus is, how do we actually think about adding, uh, to Councilor Zakem's point, more places for pickup or drop off of packages? How do we think about the impact of removing lanes of parking for dedicated bus lanes, all those sort of pieces? So that's the piece that we're building, but Catherine, you can talk more about Catherine, the did, actual. Did I understand you say, Chief, that the off-street inventory has been done? Can you speak? Yeah, so we did in, in this report, and again, I'm happy I can send it to all of your offices um, when I get back um, to my office. Um, it's available online to anyone. It was uh, an attempt to add an initial um, inventory of off-street parking. It does, because of be, because there isn't one spot already, it did have to pull from multiple sources, one, two, three, four, five different sources. And actually, I think um, Mr. Fiendaka might even be able to speak to it better than me. I know Boston... Um, Fire Department has some data, the TAPA agreements have some data, the BRA, BRA at the time, um, had some of the data, so we kind of had to pull it all together, and from that inventory, um, we estimated about 380,000 off-street spots. Now, that would not include small, like, driveways on the side of a home. Um, oh, really? Yeah. And so I'm really yeah, interested in that, um, as well as kind of the, the lots, 
to the we extent that we can get that information and really understanding it by neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how you're, you'd go about getting that. I don't know if it's in partnership with you know other uh, agencies within the city, but I think it is important to kind of understand where there's available parking to have a more comprehensive view of this. So this, just to be clear, this 380,000 parking spots off street does not mm -hmm. include residential driveways. Is that what you're the, saying? It, it would include, would it include none of them or some? I know it doesn't include most of them. It, it would it would generally not include the the private driveways. Those would be you know, part part of someone's um, own you know personal residence. Uh, but the extra the, the project that um, ABC did for us was really a great um, uh, sort of data gathering by Nelson Nygaard, mm -hmm. and they uh, sort of worked with the city to identify what information do we need and the off street parking. Um, spaces was really a great tool to inform us. You know, what is the what's the private uh, ownership out there and the private availability? Uh, there are two neighborhoods in the, in the city that also participate in what we call a parking freeze, um, that was enacted for environmental purposes to reduce auto emissions. So the off street parking, commercially available off street parking spaces, are capped in East Boston and parts of South Boston as well, um, and those have been. Uh, very successful tools in terms of sort of managing the overall off-street parking supply in those two neighborhoods. Right, and then there are the on-street parking spaces mm -hmm. uh, in commercial districts and some of our main streets that are not metered, and I'm just wondering again what the plans are for that to help turn mm -hmm. over um, parking in those areas to help the businesses and help people who want to sure. shop. Uh, able to do that, so. And yeah, that is something that uh, we've heard from community groups. It did come up at, at our council hearing as well. Uh, we are certainly open to implementing you know, paid parking meters in other areas of the city beyond the downtown, particularly if they meet a need of the business community and allow us to better manage turnover at those spaces so that customers can get to the curb and get into those locations. Uh, but you know, a very uh, sort of telling comment was, uh, comments were made here at, at the hearing about the availability of off-street parking and the relationship to that with traffic congestion, um, and how uh, we do strive to take that holistic approach. That the argument can be said that if you build it, they will come, and if they come, they'll be in their cars, creating <laughs> congestion. Um, not to say that, you know, by, by saying we're not going to build any meets people's needs, but certainly um, building, the, building housing around transit hubs creates an opportunity for transit-oriented development, which in turn allows a reduction in off-street parking ratios. So giving people an equitable, convenient, reliable, and accessible option to get around is really, I think, for, for the city and transportation, is key to you know, our approach to better management of transportation and mobility overall. Um, in Go Boston 2030, which came out shortly after the ABC report, uh, we had the opportunity to hear from thousands of people uh, be beyond the borders of Boston as well, people who need to come into the city and what their vision is for mobility. And largely re we heard that uh, you know, unlocking transit is, is uh, integral to how we think about mobility for the future. So building those transit hubs where people have access to a car share, bike share, um, and a transit hub, as well as open space and a walkable public realm are really how we want to think about how we, how we manage mobility in our neighborhoods. I would agree, and I would also argue that we need uh, better public transportation, certainly better mm -hmm. buses if we're going to um, you know, get to that that vision. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, so, you know, at the meeting that I held in Roxbury last week, issues around engagement, around enforcement, really important to, to turn over the spots, um, but also equity. And so, you know, I, I think we're kind of in a new day now. Um, whenever I'm in a vehicle, it takes forever to get from one block to the next. Mm -hmm whatever time of day, whatever the weather, whatever day of the week, it's this new normal. Um, and I think the more 
parking we build, the more cars that come to your, your earlier point. So creating these alternatives are certainly important. That being said, there are many residents who rely on their vehicles. There are many residents who want residential parking. There are many residents who don't want residential parking. I think having a system that uh, looks, one that engages residents, yes, but also looks at need, that it's not just about the squeaky wheel or the residents who have the capacity, mm -hmm. the resources to kind of organize themselves, but really thinking about how we kind of roll this out in a way that's gonna be equitable is, is very important. Um, so I, I would certainly uh, encourage that. I can wait for, for follow-up on additional questions if you wanna go around to other counselors. So, so thank you all. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Councilor Flynn. Thank, thank you, Councilor Wu, and thank you, Councilor Wu, for your leadership on, on this issue. Um, this is an important discussion for us to have across the city. Many residents in my neighborhood in, in South Boston and across District 2 um, talk to me about this issue every day. Um, they tell me about the greater need for enforcement for vehicles without resident parking stickers. We recently increased this from 40 to $60. I think there could be room to go further uh, for those without a sticker, and especially out-of-state plates. Um, residents have also talked to me about their frustration looking for parking spots for up to an hour, driving around um, only to see the spot taken by a, a car from New Hampshire or Rhode Island. Um, the frustration is, is very real uh, throughout my district. Um, but the bigger issue for me, um, certainly we, I support um, various fee increases, but the issue that's important to me is public safety. Um, you know, South Boston especially has had unregulated development for almost 30 years. We just have so many cars on the street. Um, there's, no, there's no place for them, but also, um, what concerns me the most is elderly people crossing the street. Um, Sorry. Uh, mothers with, with children, fathers with children crossing the street. Um, it's, it's very dangerous. I recently conducted a, um, held a hearing on Saturday on the corner of Farragut Road and, and Broadway in South Boston. I think about 100 people showed up at nine o'clock in the morning and um, they're frightened about public safety, about crossing the street. Um, L Street is used as a, as a cut through to go up to Summer Street into Salt Station. It's in downtown Boston. The speed limit's 25. I think it should be reduced to 20 or, or even lower than that. But, um, you know, I think public safety has to be um, discussed as we have a discussion about increasing um, fees as well. Um, so I just hope I can work with your office um, more closely to have a better public safety plan in, in South Boston. The same in the South End, crossing the streets is, um, is very dangerous. In, in Chinatown, it's very dangerous. So I think we need a, a comprehensive plan from the Transportation Department to, um, to address public safety issues. Um, I know it's off topic a little bit, but that, that's what's important to me. Um, Commissioner, on designated, on, on valet services, I know Councilor Sabi George talked about it, um, is there any designated valet parking spots on public streets? Um, no, we designate curbside space for pickup and drop off at valet zones. So there's no uh, storage of vehicles at the curb for valet operations. There are spaces allocated so the vehicle can safely get to the curb, and then a valet operator is required to take that vehicle within, um, at hotels, I believe it's 15 minutes, and uh, 15 minutes at, at restaurants, and move that vehicle to the off-street parking facility. So are they taking up any public spaces at all, these restaurants or hotels? They are not allowed to utilize any of the curbside space to actually park the vehicles there for uh, beyond 15 minutes. I've seen a lot of restaurants um, throughout Boston that have valet parking right out mm -hmm. in front of their, their restaurant for, for hours. 
We, we will certainly step up enforcement of those zones, Councilor. We um, actually just renewed our valet permits in the city of Boston, so we will be sure to emphasize the permit provisions with those operators. One of the, one of the big issues I have, uh, Commissioner, is you know, years ago you would see a single family in South Boston. It'd have, it'd have one car in the, in the house, and now it's three condos and probably could be nine parking spots. You know, the, the city, the neighborhood just can't sustain that. So you have nine additional cars with resident stickers on, on the street. Um, you know, are we, are, do, do we have an unlimited number of resident stickers that we're just putting out there, even though that there's no more parking spots? Um, people are renting parking in my community for $400 a, a month. And at some, time, at some point, um, th people are gonna leave the city. That, that is an important point, Councillor, and we know that um, certainly things have changed over the last few decades in terms of um, how our homes are occupied in the city. And as you stated, something that used to be a single family home that maybe had one licensed driver now has several, but there's still only that one curbside space. Um, there currently is no limit on the number of parking permits that um, are, we make available to residents if they meet the requirements, but we do strive to provide the access to those transit opportunities and to provide access to car share spaces and to encourage people to think of other ways of getting around and provide those options so that they're not so reliant on owning a vehicle in the city. Thank you, Commissioner. I just want to ask if, if your office will work with me um, and my staff on public safety issues. That's, that's critical. That's my number one issue. That's the number one mm -hmm. constituent um, request I get is public safety, pedestrian safety, and I'm very concerned about um, our elderly, the disabled crossing the street. It's, um, it's a big concern of mine. We, we share your concern, Councillor, and I know that um, two of my staff are actively working on some of the requests to improve safety um, uh, at uh, Broadway and Farragut, as well as the other locations that you've identified to us that, to put pedestrian delineators and um, speed radar boards and to improve crossing site distances. So we are certainly committed to public safety, and uh, we look forward to working with you. And one final question. Commissioner, um, would you consider, um, I know the mayor did an excellent job um, mobilizing the city on reducing the um, speed limit in Boston. Can we, go, can we even go further than that? Can we reduce it another five miles an hour? Um, I, I think 25, 25 miles an hour on, on city streets is, is too fast. Um, there, I'd like to see it 20, I'd, I'd even like to see it 15. We'll work with you, Council, because there are locations in the city where we've identified them as safety zones, and if they're in close proximity to a school, a hospital, senior centers, a location that have a large amount of vulnerable users, mm -hmm. we have reduced the speeds to 20 miles per hour. Um, you will notice some of those uh, already signed and marked, and uh, particularly around schools where we have the school zone flashers, and we have signage, so if there are areas that you'd like us to look at, we will certainly do that. Thank you for your help, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Councillor Edwards. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to first say thank you for the work you've already done in trying to approach parking and um, how we've been able to, when we do have issues with parking, go straight to your department and really work with how we can get to a neighborhood level. So I wanted to thank the Commissioner for that. Um, I think one of the biggest things I have heard when I reach out to, um, or when the community reaches out about this issue, which I, I would probably say it's probably the number one issue, when they say traffic, it, like I would say more than 50% has to do with parking, being able to put their car someplace, along with being able to move their car when they're in it. But it, is, it does come down, I think, to the core issue of enforcement. Um, and. I appreciate, again, your, your leadership in being able to push for it, and I'm very happy that we've increased the fines representing the North End specifically. Uh, one of the biggest issues is that um, people could uh, basically pay for a parking ticket or pay to park in the garden. Either way, they were out the same amount of money, and they usually weren't from the neighborhood. So, so what we wanted to do was make sure that as they were paying, they were really paying a real fine for parking in our neighborhood mm -hmm. streets. Um, so I guess some of my... Um, my 
my questions are really more for the folks from the Boston Cycling Union and just get me, help me be more clear about that. I don't see enforcement as a big issue for you in, the, in your suggestions right now, and I'm wondering why um, not using in all of the tools we have currently uh, before we go and invent new ones, um, why isn't that a priority for you? Because again, and we'll talk about you know how you, how you've gotten to your informed decisions, but for right now, why that isn't a priority? I, I wouldn't say it's not a priority. I think that what we need to do is um, really take a look at the system in place and ask you know how do we get here and and how is this serving or not serving um, residents currently? Um, I think to the point of we don't we're giving away more permits than we necessarily have in a given neighborhood. I think is an issue and it's going to just create more um, stress and strain over who's parking where on our streets. Um, I think that having enforcement come into play um, down the line could be useful, but um, we do have to think about like what kind of system are we enforcing to begin with. I think that's the, the concerns that we're really trying to address um, with the ideas around reform. It's, it seems a lot of your suggestions are more geared towards not necessarily parking reform, but just car ownership reform and, and almost making it a little bit more burdensome to have multiple cars in the city. And that's one of the biggest critiques I'm hearing from my constituents is that these are not alleviating much. They are placing burdens on in addition to owning a car, which I, I've heard from some folks from your organization, cars place burdens on the city. So I just wanted to make sure we're very clear about this. Are you, are you, is this really kind of a disguise for really parking, car ownership reform, or is this actual parking reform? Because I'm seeing this as an ownership issue. Um, I, would certain, I would certainly not say that. I think that what we're seeing is, you know, people who are fighting over every inch of curbside space and circling the block for um, 10, 20, 30 minutes, up to an hour sometimes, trying to look for a space, that doesn't serve people as well. And so we have to figure out what are our physical constraints and how are we gonna work with them. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think that that's actually putting the onus on the ownership, it's trying to figure out how do we make it easier for people to actually own cars in the, in the city, so. When, when you talk about, um, and I, I, you, some of the numbers you have in here, that 50%, of the folks who make $25,000 or less don't own cars, and then I think 7% of people who make $100,000 or more actually don't own cars, and, and talk about an equity issue. You know, I live in a district where we have the largest housing project mm -hmm. in New England, and across the street from million dollar homes. So my district, I think, is a microcosm of income inequality. And for so many people, being able to access and own a car is a sign of making it. So these fines, to me, are a further impediment of their access to or being able to get a car, it almost seems like they're, um, I don't know how we're making it more equitable for, for, for making it harder for poor people to access car ownership. Can I say something about enforcement, which? Before, before you do, okay. I'd like for them to answer the question okay. about poor people accessing car ownership. You know, that's that's a, a big question. And I think it, do, it, it does go to some of um, what the end goals are. And so, um, you know, we know we have space issues. We know we have congestion issues. Um, we know that it's um, not allocated equitably right now. And if the end goal is to make it easier um, or subsidize low income car ownership, um, the way we're doing it now is we're doing it by subsidizing everybody's use of curb space. And is that actually the best way to achieve the goal of low income car ownership? I'm not, you know, if, if, that, is, if that is a goal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would say that, I just, is it car ownership that's the goal or is it mobility for everyone that's the goal? Um, but but, but we're, we're addressing yeah. the, I That's fair. What we're not addressing is that as a goal. The question is equity, right? When you, you ring the bell of equity throughout your comments, constantly talking about equity, and I'm seeing you putting an impediment that is a burdensome on poor people. So, so just with it, that kind of discourse. And so speaking of equity and speaking of perspectives and being at the table, tell me about your organization and the diversity in it, the income um, diversity in your organization. You talk about seniors, you talk about people with disabilities, are your members that? Are, is your leadership reflective of those things? 
are their voices about what would be equitable for them reflected in these policies, or did you look at statistics, did you look at numbers, and reflect it for them? Um, I mean, what we have been doing has been trying to um, listen to Bostonians about their parking concerns, um, and it has been an issue that has been uh, brought to the forefront in talking to residents and talking to um, people who are commuters in, in the area. And yeah, a lot of this information has been from those concerns, but also looking at what other cities are doing and thinking about policy and what do we want to achieve as a, a city. I think that, you know, given processes like Go Boston 2030, we went through um, a lot of listening and trying to figure out what Boston, Bostonians want to achieve. And I think that what we heard is that people want to have more mobility access, more um, you know, access to opportunity and to move around our region. And, you know, we have to figure out how we're going to do that now. And I think that this is, uh, these ideas and these policies are some of the tools that we have in our toolkit. I think they're open for debate and we have to kind of um, consider and weigh each, each reform. So. I think my, my point is um, when you're going to talk about equity for a certain group, if that group is not reflected in your leadership or in the studying of or being directly asked by you what makes more equal, mm -hmm. then I, I'm really concerned about how you speak with such <coughs> confidence about what is equity. And that's all I'm saying. And that's for any organization, including mm -hmm. the city of Boston. Yep, point taken. Yeah, of course. Um, hey, can, can, I, can I actually respond to that sure. a little bit too? I, I completely appreciate that. And I am certainly not one to, to speak about all equity issues. And as a business member association, I can guarantee you, um, you know, our membership and our leadership does not look like in a complete cross-section of the regional area. But I also, you know, when we talk about equity, we, we um, uh, what I'm, we may misspeak about when, um, where the focus is, but what I would also say is it's incredibly unequitable right now um, for low-income neighborhoods to be subsidizing the wealthy's ownership of cars as well. And so we are, we're not starting with an equitable system right now and pretending that doing these reforms is going to um, to shift that. You know, I think the way we're looking at it is it's actually um, already incredibly inequitable um, in, in how it's structured. And so we'd love to talk to you about, you know, maybe how we present that in a better way or what data we should be collecting. Um, but I do think that it's fair to say that if you do shift some of, of the costs onto the people who can pay, you can achieve some some more equitable distribution of that space usage. Right, and I, and I don't think the, the debate is that we want the, the same thing. I think the, the question is directed at when you talk about reforms, right, who is informing what is a true equitable reform for your organization? That, that is what I mean. Are you hearing from the individuals in the Bunker Hill Housing Project or the McCormick or around the city who may not have cars, who are, are they at your table? When you say we, are they part of that we in helping you come up with these reforms? It would make these more, um, this would be stronger if they were here testifying and saying they wanted these things. The folks, the seniors that you're talking about, the people with disabilities, if they were the ones testifying about this, mm -hmm. that's all I'm saying. My final question is, when you talk about the, um, the cap or you talk about implementing reforms that would limit the amount of spaces that are here or have the spaces and, and permits reflect the car ownership here, what do you do with the cars that are already existing that might be over that limit? Uh, Mark, if you want to sure. speak to that, yeah. I, I would say we have a system right now that you can argue works or not. I mean, it, you know. It's an expensive system in terms of people who are paying for fines or people who are wasting time looking for parking. And it's a system. And if there are more cars than there are spaces, I think there's an element of grandfathering, which mm -hmm. is we start with a system we have, and then you put a new system in that if it makes sense to apply to people now, then apply it. But if it's not going to make sense because, as you say, there are too many cars and what happens to the cars now, I think you apply this standard to people who are moving into the neighborhood. And uh, since equity is being mentioned, I do think income is a key element. There's lots of different kinds of equity, I think. 
you know, there's issues of power and there's issues of education and all kinds of things that aren't necessarily income related. But I think as a baseline, having an affordable permit that is pretty easily accessible and that you don't have too many hoops to getting that, and I'm not sure that's something that would be a great thing to ask the community, which would be, you know, if we wanted to determine who should get a discounted permit, how would we know who's eligible? And they would tell you, well, you know, I get this assistance, and maybe if I get this, I get a discounted permit. But I, I think that, that grandfathering is a key thing. I, I, I will say, just on enforcement, that it's who you're enforcing that is key. And if it's your communities that you're trying to protect that are paying the fines, I think that's a bad thing. And there's very little sympathy for other people who maybe should be paying fines, you know, for just, I, I hate to pick out transportation network companies. I use them and I like them myself. So it's, it's kind of hypocritical, but I think they are a, a juicier target for enforcement because probably they don't vote, you know, and probably they are going to, you know, they have a lot of startup money backing them and they can afford the fine versus say your resident who might be low income bought the car because it's an important status symbol and now has to pay a hundred dollar ticket because the system didn't work well. They would have rather paid something else. I don't, it's, it's a question. So mm -hmm. I, I feel it's a discussion, but we're starting with a system that clearly doesn't work very well. I'm going to have to leave pretty soon because I, I am flying out tomorrow and I've got a lot of things to do before I leave, but I'm happy to take a question or two more if anyone has one. Um, what about incentivizing folks to not use cars? So have you, have you thought in your studies about subsidizing tea usage, making sure that the, the city provides free bus passes, not just for students or reduced rates? There's ways in which you don't necessarily um, punish or fine your way out of a problem, but you actually make it better, easier to use public transportation have you thought about those things? I, I definitely think that one of the, the things that um, could go to, uh, in collecting potentially like new revenue for parking permits, you could figure out programs that you want to create that could target those, um, those needs. And um, last week we were um, here for the hearing that the um, city held for the, um, the MBTA's new forthcoming uh, fare collection system, AFC 2.0. And one of the things that we are pushing for through that is low income fares, because there's an opportunity in revisiting fare structures to think about what kinds of programs you want to create to benefit um, low income riders and other equity based groups. Um, so I think that that's definitely something that's on the table and could definitely work. Um, I think w what's important to know now is, you know, with these new uh, fines that are coming in next week, um, that there already is this kind of uh, stick approach. and. You know, even in thinking about reform, it might not seem like a carrot at first, but I think it, it will help um, better manage the spaces we have and think about what kinds of needs do we want to make provisions for, mm -hmm. um, whether it's like making sure that there are um, spaces for people with disabilities on your block, if there are people who live there, et cetera. Because right now we don't think about those um, kinds of programs. But. And to your, um, to your earlier point, I just wanted to say that if, um, you know, we're more than happy to work with you to talk with your constituents about their concerns around um, parking. You know, if, if you want to do like a listening session with um, some of your constituents around these issues, we're more than happy to come to the table and, and participate in that as well. Thank you. Um, and I just want to commend already again the um, administration's uh, leadership on the parking pass for the specifically for the aides that help out our seniors. I really do hope we can get that going as soon as possible. I think that that would be a huge relief for a lot of people to have their, 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 their aides that help them with the basic things, bathing, things like that, not have to rush out to get a ticket. I, I'm gonna push and, and challenge the administration to also consider the same thing for our teachers. I know we've had conversations about it. Uh, teachers have approached me about how they're leaving the classroom to go feed that meter or avoid a ticket. I know the challenges are out there. I just wanna make sure that we're say thank you for the work you're doing, but really we need to push on, on other forms of relief as well, visitors pass, things like that. Thank you. That's okay. it. Okay, thanks Council Edwards. Um, so I had a couple questions, a lot of which, a lot of it has been covered already. Um, we talked about on and off street parking and understanding that as part of the census and 
the drive, I th again, I, I want to back up what Councilor Janey said in terms of a neighborhood and the, having the data available that shows there are a certain number of on-street parking spots. It's very different when there are, when people don't have driveways and that's all they have versus a neighborhood where most, most of the houses have at least one or two spots that they could squeeze in right, right at the home. So, I mean, there must be a way, is there a way to see from building approval, your construction approvals, how many deeded spots there were presented in the plans, we should be able to catch that somehow, right? The, the, the data is um, sort of scattered, but it's really up to us to, to mm -hmm. identify how we can collect that data and really use it uh, to inform our parking policies and curbside management. Uh, you know, one thing that we really are focused on, though, is identifying the gaps in our transit system, uh, particularly around areas where people are, uh, we've seen vehicle ownership increase in, in low-income and farm barn re residents. Mm -hmm. And we know that a lot of those people um, really don't have good transit options, particularly um, early morning or, or late night. And mm -hmm. that's been uh, one of our number one priorities, uh, particularly for, for the, the chief and the new urban mechanics and working with the MBTA to identify where those gaps are and who we're serving with um, with our pilot program with the MBTA to have early morning service and, and we look at uh, look forward to working with them for late night service as well because that all works together uh, to decrease reliance on uh, personal cars to get around and we know that a lot of people they, they don't have options. Um, I wanted to ask about the city's willingness to think about neighborhood specific pilots. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Councilor Edwards brings up some important issues and I mean, I want to vouch for at least the organizations and the coalition that Andrew's representing here being at the events that are focused on social justice and economic justice and coming mm -hmm. from a place where equity is front and center and talking about improving bus service, which the majority of residents served by bus service um, are people of color, are, mm -hmm. are low income residents. Um, if there were, so anyway, what I'm saying is that any program that we put in place wouldn't just be, I feel like it'd be, the odds are very slim, it would just be a straight fee and that would be it. There would have to, there would be considerations for seniors, for um, low income residents, probably for residents with disabilities, et cetera. The price point would vary. There are a lot of things to think of. If there's, is there a wait list? Is there a cap? This and that. If a certain neighborhood, we could demonstrate that there was consensus around whatever list of criteria we put together and there were lots of public meetings about that, would the city be comfortable at some point doing a pilot of just a, a neighborhood or multiple neighborhoods but not citywide? I think we've shown our willingness to use pilots as a way to inform policy on a broader scale. Uh, one program that's worked particularly well and been successful is the street cleaning pilot in Charlestown, mm -hmm. where we eliminated towing and we raised the fine. Um, that informed our proposal with regard to the new parking fines that will take effect on July 2nd, where we are now eliminating overnight towing for street cleaning citywide um, and increasing the fine. So working with with the council, with the community groups to identify, you know, what does um, this, this pilot look like and mm -hmm. what exactly are we trying to learn from it and how can we make sure that we structure it in a way that we collect meaningful data that can mm -hmm. uh, meet the needs of, of the community that we're trying to serve and solve the problem out there as well as inform us as we move forward. Okay, because I think the neighbor, we, there are certain neighborhoods that are particularly stressed about the current resident parking system, and if it were possible to put together a package of, you know, a certain price point, maybe with visitor parking permits available at a at a different price point, um, but with commitments around enforcement at, at specific levels. So there are a lot of considerations, but I think when we're presenting everything to a community, rather than just saying, "Are you willing to pay for something that you get for free right now?" but you know. Putting a, putting a price tag on, on this resource in this way with these conditions will give you these benefits in return that are concrete and tangible, I think is a different conversation. So um, this was meant, this hearing was meant to be just the first of uh, many more conversations and, and future ones hopefully in the neighborhoods and districts that are most affected. Um, and then just find my last question on enforcement. Is there a way to ramp that up? And that, that's probably the number one thing that I heard as this 
idea that we were even having a hearing um, kind of got out publicly. People saying to me, I'd actually be okay. I would be fine paying something for a residential par parking permit, $25, fine. I, I would be able to afford that even though I don't want to. Um, however, I feel that it's not right that I would be asked to pay even $1 if we see right now that there are out-of-state car license plates there and, and cars without stickers taking up the current spots. Any way to, is there plans to ramp up that enforcement now? Um, yes, as the chief indicated earlier, in our budget we do have an additional enforcement supervisor. Um, over the, the past six months, we've brought in enforce, it's assistant director of parking enforcement that's looking at our shift structure and our, and our route analysis and deployment strategy. Um, you know, we also re receive thousands of requests for parking enforcement, particularly through 311. A lot of those requests come in after hours. A lot of those requests come in on the weekends. We want to make sure that we have the resources and the strategy in place so that, that we can adequately enforce any curbside regulations that we implement. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Jane, did you have more questions? Just, I guess, uh, final thought. I, I won't um, go on too long because I know people want to testify. Um, so, you know, this is, a, again, a hot button issue. I know the current system, if someone, if a resident wants residential parking, they've got to do the kind of the petition, get all their neighbors or 51% of their neighbors to agree, which, you know, requires that they really spend some time, some effort, some energy, they have the capacity to do so, et cetera, et cetera. But this has an impact not just on the residents of that particular street, but on the surrounding neighborhood. And so once that one street becomes residential parking only, you then have spillover for the residents that don't have stickers, who won't go get stickers for whatever reason. And I would imagine if we're charging fees at some point, that might be a, another hurdle for someone who doesn't want to come and get, not that we shouldn't, but that could just be another barrier. Mm -hmm. um, so, But this has implications for other streets, kind of like a domino effect, right. which then would make the, the little bit available parking on those other streets mm -hmm. uh, even more of a strain mm -hmm. for residents and trying to protect those spots. And so I'm just wondering that there were some other municipalities that were mentioned earlier um, Somerville, as an example, there was something in San Francisco. Someone mentioned before reward for car-free households. I'm wondering if there are examples of where that's happening to kind of ease the strain uh, anywhere else that we know of. Um, I'm the car-free household, the incentives the, for the car-free households. The, someone the car mentioned free it, household. and I think it was someone on this side. Yeah, no, no, I mentioned yeah. it as, you know, potential of what you could do with Other revenue that's... Um, I will get back to you on that. Okay. I don't know of exact model. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of any specific. models, but I, it, it's something that we could look into for sure. We'll get mm -hmm. back to you. Yeah. And I guess I raised that earlier example just mm -hmm. as another indication that our system is broken. So 51% of the residents on that particular street agree. Mm -hmm. Maybe the other 49 yeah. didn't or didn't participate or whatever happened, but then you still have all the other residents mm -hmm. on the surrounding streets that will be impacted. So. Um, I'm looking forward to continued conversation uh, on this very important issue, and I thank you again for calling. The so, Councilor, just to um, sort of provide some context for the resident permit program in general, um, our application process is out on our city's website, but uh, basically what usually happens is we will hear through the um, neighborhood services coordinator for a district and uh, usually counselor that folks um, are experiencing parking issues in their neighborhoods and they think that a resident permit program might help them. So uh, we make available the information on how to obtain a resident permit program. Uh, we generally require that the petitions be submitted to us, but we like to take a zone approach, so we don't want that one-off street mm -hmm. that's only going to negatively impact all of the surrounding streets because people will very quickly find out where those free parking spaces are. Um, so we want to make sure that we're going in and we're actually solving a problem. And, and when we implement a resident permit program that we inform all of the residents in terms of what the requirements are to participate in it and what our um, obligation will be to go out and sign the area to um, enforce the program. Sometimes if it's a new program and it's a large area, we'll actually bring the city hall to go truck out there so that we can issue parking permits so folks don't have to come to city hall. 
Um, but we really want to work with neighborhood groups to, pr to craft a program that addresses a need, not just solve sort of a, a one-off problem on, on one street. Um, we also will go out and attend community meetings. We want to present, you know, what's our concept of a program and what does it look like for you? Uh, we don't expect the, the residents, we don't want to put that burden on them to say we want a, a program for a eight to six or an overnight program. Um, let us go out and, and take a survey and find out what, what are the parking issues and um, what can we work together with to come up with for a solution for you and make it work. Yeah, I can appreciate that. Um, I have experienced and residents that I've spoken to that you know, for example, Center Street, Roxbury is now residential parking and it has had a spillover effect on other streets. And so it forces the residents of the other streets to then say, well, we have to get it too because all of the people who used to park on Center who can no longer park because maybe they didn't go do the city hall to go or didn't come down here or there could be other issues. I know in my district a lot of families are doubled up not everyone is on a lease or has a bill in their name, cannot necessarily get their vehicle registered at the ad address where they actually lay their head, mm -hmm. whatever, that they may not then be eligible for this program. And so they're just, you know, these other issues. And I, I look at this as the beginning mm -hmm. um, of, a conver of a longer mm -hmm. conversation. And so I do appreciate the work that, that all of you are doing. Um, and really making sure that we're hearing from residents and engaging them as this process moves forward. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Janey. Uh, thank you. Any final words or thoughts from panelists? Mr. McGuire? <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much. Feel free thank to um, stay in, in the audience if you'd like, but um, we'll move now to public testimony. I really appreciate all of your time. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. As we, so we have um, five people signed up for public testimony at this point. Um, and if anyone else has moved during the testimony, you can, you can jump in at the end. I'll call the names and if you can make your way down to either one of these two um, standing microphones on the, on the back over here and we'll rotate from side to side. So first, Grant Schomburg, Will Statman, Cole Giannini, Martin Roeder, and Danielle. And oh, and please, uh, as you begin, please state your name and address for the record. And if you could keep your testimony to two minutes or under, that'd be much appreciated. Uh, Grant Schomburg, 250 Beacon Street. And I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Wu for initiating this, and also I was very encouraged by the report, A Better City and the 2030 report, as well as what I've seen the city doing online, because I think that there's real movement in this area that is, is positive. Having said that, I think that it looks as though Boston and these people who testified are moving in a direction that to me is logical, but none of them has really stated that logical conclusion, namely that to ameliorate uh, the problems that they cite in terms of on-street parking, the parking fees on street should be set at a level that will produce this performance parking, namely a situation in which you can drive up and park. So. Charging for parking permits reduces the ability to acquire multiple permits, but it'll have only a limited effect. The more important change is to impose on-street parking fees throughout the city. In other words, I'm saying the logical conclusion of what I hear today, and certainly where technology is available and possible, is to abolish the parking permit program and charge fees for on-street parking that are consistent with performance, namely consistent with having streets with parking places available when you need them. This accomplishes what streets are meant to be for, which is to have mobility. People can come, they can visit, they can use 
the street. They don't have to clog up the streets with driving around looking for a place. So we heard all of the problems that are caused, but we haven't yet heard a move toward what I'm proposing, which is namely to have on-street parking fees. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean meters because we have technology such as transponders and other ways to monitor what's going on. And those methods will certainly in the future uh, be enhanced. But I'm just saying that if you want to reduce the demand for something because the supply is too great, then you increase the price of that thing. And we're not talking about the demand for permits. We're talking about the demand for on-street parking. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Grant. Um, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about how that would work, so not meters. Um, well, of course, could be meters. We could, could meter meters, all the streets. It could not. How? But for example, there are situ there is technology. Uh, I believe they use it in Aspen. That you have a device. Not so much the technology piece okay. of it. The the fee structure. So, all are right. we suggesting that? Um, that if I live at a certain address and my car, I don't have a driveway in my car, and I don't own a car, but if I owned a car, <laughs> that if my car was parked in front of my house because I don't have a driveway, that you would be charged by the hour, by the minute, by the day, by the week? What, what do you envision when you say fees instead of Well, I envision stickers? a fee that is one that you would understand. So it would probably be a fee for the day and then maybe a fee for night, depending on how the demand and the supply adjust based on that fee. So in places where parking is sufficient or excessive, probably there would be no fee for parking at night. But in my neighborhood, in the back bay, there certainly would be a fee because you can't find a parking place in the middle of the night. And so you would have a parking fee that is uh, based on the performance of the that fee, although you certainly wouldn't want it to vary by hour because it'd be very confusing for people. So just like the very good, I think, experiment that's done in Back Bay with raising the fee mm -hmm. of the meters from $1.25 to 375 you do experiments to decide in individual neighborhoods or even individual streets what a reasonable fee is so that there's parking available and so mobility is enhanced and people aren't frustrated and pollution doesn't, and, uh, you know, congestion don't occur. Thank you. Thank Hi, you, my, my name Will. is Will Statman. I live at 37 Revere Street um, and I love everything this guy said. Um, he's absolutely on the right track um, and to, to add to what he was saying, um, there is actually potentially a very simple way to manage residential parking permits, which is to do a census, figure out what the supply is, and then adjust the price up so supply and demand reach equilibrium. And if you do that neighborhood by neighborhood, you can imagine that, say, down in Dorchester where there's less density, people might uh, find the equilibrium is a cost of just, say, $5 a month. But in a crowded neighborhood like Beacon Hill or the Back Bay, people might uh, be willing to pay much more, like $75 or $100 a month. And that's comparable to the cost of living in each neighborhood. Um, that would, would maximize the revenue for the city, and that could be potentially reallocated for things like transit, or if it's identified that there isn't enough parking for low-income residents, uh, that, that money could be allocated to help them get permits. Um, so really, a lot of parking issues come up because people think that economics and supply and demand don't apply to parking, but they absolutely do. And what we're seeing right now in Boston is a tragedy of the commons, where the, the curb space is a free for all, there's not enough parking, and if we charge the right amount, uh, that will go away. Um, sort of one thing to think about is every month the city of Boston auctions off impounded cars, and they don't give them away for free and they don't just set an arbitrary price. They're auctioned off, and that's fair, because people pay how much they're worth. Parking spaces can be handled in a similar way. Um, another point I want to make is that this, 
this sort of study of parking and how to manage it in Boston isn't being done in a vacuum. A lot of other American cities are having this problem. And it's way too easy to let parking debates be about feelings or pseudoscience or anything like that. So I want to make you aware, there's a parking Bible. It's called The High Cost of Free Parking, uh, written by a UCLA professor uh, named Donald Chu. And everyone should read it uh, and educate themselves to really have a good debate about parking. Um, and uh, that's all I have for you today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I don't see Cole. Is Cole here? OK. Cole, as you're wake, making your way down, I'm going to ask Martin to go ahead. Martin, feel oh. free. Thank you. My name is um, Martin Rett. I'm the chair of the Neighborhood Association of the Back Bay. So obviously, my job is to defend the interests of residents. Um, this is clearly a very important uh, set of issues that we're dealing with. How important it is, is that I have foregone the opportunity to watch live the World Cup match between my country of origin, England and Belgium, which started at two o'clock. And if anybody knows the score, please let me know. Um, more seriously, uh, the Back Bay was, of course, privileged to be selected as the neighborhood for a pilot parking program so that our parking rates became three times those of the neighboring neighborhoods. And of course, what happens in Back Bay, unlike Las Vegas, does not stay in Back Bay. And equally, what happens in other neighborhoods, as you pointed out, uh, does not stay there, but has, uh, but has ripple effects. Um, uh, Grant Schoenberg, who is a colleague of mine within NAB, and we have many lively debates about subjects on which we disagree sometimes, and sometimes we agree, uh, makes a very interesting point. But I think he also then raises the question, should there be a distinction made between residents of Boston and people who come into the city and need to park? And if you believe that there should be no distinction that being a resident of Boston does not entitle you to any advantages such as uh, residential only parking spaces, compared to non-residents, then his argument has uh, considerable, uh, considerable validity. Um, I'm not so sure that's the case, and probably many of the members of NAB would not agree with that. Uh, I, we've, we haven't taken a formal position on this, but we certainly agree with a lot of what has been said that it doesn't make any sense under any circumstances to have no cap on the number of residential parking permits or to have them all available for free. And there are all kinds of schemes that one can come up with as to whether you should get one for free and then pay for others. Um, there are, however, other issues that come up in the question of parking. And one that has been raised is that of fines, which have now been increased. Um, a couple of points I'd like to make about that. One is it would really help, particularly for somebody, say, coming from out of state who thinks, oh, there's a free space. It says residential only parking, but what the heck, I'll risk it. Well, they probably don't know what the fine is. Why not have signs that say, and maybe you could even cheat a bit and say actually the fine is $1,000 if you get caught. And that might dissuade them from doing something that makes a resident furious. Um, there's been a fair amount of discussion of equity. And equity, of course, is something that's very much in the eye of the beholder. Um, I'm mindful of what apparently they do in Finland, which is a country that in some respects actually has been more successful in achieving um, less inequality, I'll put it that way, than in the United States, in which fines, the level of a fine is graduated according to the income of the person who does the violation. Now, whether that's practical or not, I don't know, but maybe it's something worth figuring about. Uh, thinking about. Other things that one can observe elsewhere that might be worthwhile considering that could help the situation, congestion pricing, which as you know in several cities, notably London, has actually been quite successful in influencing traffic patterns. That may be completely politically impossible. I would also like to see uh, costs. For example, if somebody wants a residential parking permit for a Hummer, they should have to pay $10,000 because those cars take up more than one parking space. 
And unless you have uh, reasons why certain kinds of behavior are going to be punished more than others, you won't get change. The final point I'd like to make is, can we also think about incentives? Um, I've heard of some scheme, it was pointed out to me by another member of NAB, I think it's in Sweden, in which they actually have surveillance cameras, and I know that's not quite possible uh, yet in Massachusetts in terms of speeding, in which uh, the speeds of cars are recorded, and if you actually are traveling at or below the speed limit, you're entered into a lottery at which every now and again a prize is awarded. And maybe that's a kind of incentive to get people to behave properly. Because one thing that I've observed, and here perhaps we need to have psychologists, there needs to be a fundamental change in cultural attitudes in this city if any scheme is going to work. I am surprised, for example, when I see a cyclist who actually stops for a red light. I am amazed at the number of apparently English-speaking drivers who don't understand no turn on red. And all that contributes to uh, the dangers and the risks, as Councillor Flynn was saying, of public safety on our streets, in which parking is one element, but something that um, can have a significant impact upon the overall picture. So thank you again for raising this subject. Um, we've had uh, several occasions to meet with uh, Commissioner Fiandaka and Chief of States Chris Oswood in the past. We will continue to do so, and we do look forward uh, to the time when instead of the back bay being a pilot that is uniquely singled out, and we're happy to do that for the sake of the greater good, there is a Boston-wide solution, not necessarily the same for every neighborhood, that uh, more or less everybody can agree to in a sensible compromise. It may not be perfect any more than the short-term rental ordinance was perfect, but it's certainly a hell of a lot better than the situation that we have at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. I'm informed it's England zero, Belgium one. Thank you. Um, Cole, and then Danielle will be next. Hi, uh, thank you very much, Council Wu, Council Janey, for staying. Um, I do appreciate you hosting this today. I'd also like to thank uh, Council Sakem's office, uh, in particular Catherine, for being so, sorry, for being so accessible um, throughout the past couple of months when I've been in contact with them. I'm a, res a resident of the West End, um, possibly the most affected small mm -hmm. area um, of parking in the city, also next to the TD Garden, which greatly affects all movement in the area. Um, I agree with what many have said before me about enforcement. Um, I believe that if there's a, a law, a rule, something, if it's not enforced, it might as well not exist. Um, that has been a particular problem in the North End, I'm sorry, in the West End, um, circling the neighborhood for hours, vehicles from Rhode Island, vehicles from New Hampshire, um, even at some points notifying on-street law enforcement officers about the issues and being informed that there are better things to do at that particular time than enforced parking. Um, although I, I was very enthused with my previous uh, resident's speech, um, particularly the Finland part, I find interesting. I would like to have the equality of opportunity in the West End that other boroughs have. If there were, let's say, six, even six daytime parking spaces available for West End residents, which there are not at this point, there is no daytime parking. I believe, and someone, correct me if I'm wrong, please, I love to learn, but I believe that there is the only downtown neighborhood that does not have a daytime resident program. For me, myself, I work second shift, sometimes third shift. Um, it's been a terror the past six months trying to access parking in the area. Mm -hmm. My wife and I began cutting costs to try to save, uh, you know, save money for our future. Uh, we cannot afford $375 to $450 a month for parking. I believe that that neighborhood should have the same you know, opportunities that other neighborhoods have. Um, I work very hard to live there and pay the high cost of rent to live in a safe neighborhood. Very different than the neighborhood I grew up in and my wife grew up in. We wanted to live in a very safe neighborhood, but I also absolutely need my car for work. I travel around the state. 
um, I'm unable to access many of the programs that I would like to access and some that my wife accesses, such as the bike share programs, walking, the metro, et cetera. Um, as I said earlier, I would really enjoy if there were even one street de designated for resident parking. Um, I remember as a child, my dad told me if you didn't make the top three, try harder. Circling is an issue for everyone in the city. I don't believe that everyone will ever be fully satisfied with the parking program. There will never be enough spaces. We can try and we can talk about it. What the issue seems to be to me is, for instance, the resident parking program implementation, this, this petition. Logistically, that program does not work for everyone in the city, such as, speaking about my situation, some of the, I believe the, the parameters for that particular program are 50% of the residents on the street that you're asking for the residential program to be implemented on have to live on the street. Logistically, that doesn't work in some neighborhoods. Most of the people who live in, for instance, where I live at the Longfellow Towers do not park on Stanford Street. They park on the adjacent street, Lamazny Way, or Lancaster Street across. So when I was told originally by BTD and a neighborhood liaison that we don't even qualify to make a petition, I mean, first off, you're looking at putting together a petition of maybe 10,000 residents, half of that is 5,000, 51%. That is kind of a lot to ask of a resident to do if they just want to implement a simple parking program. And also, if they don't even qualify for that program because they're not on the street, that they're asking for the program, um, I don't see how that is going to work. So I, w I, I thank everyone for being here and listening and hearing these concerns. And I would just really stress that I think a lot of the current laws are, are good. A lot of the current things that are in place are good. Does it need to be changed? Absolutely. It can always be changed. It's not always going to suit everyone. But without the enforcement of that, with, without con the, the constant um, flow of people coming and parking in a, in a neighborhood, for instance, such as mine, that only has a limited amount of space, spaces already for residents, it seems that any further uh, passings of anything would be almost frivolous. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Danielle. Okay. Um, yes. Hi, Councillor Wu. Thank you so much for having this hearing. Um, I did email you um, recently, and I actually wasn't planning to be here today, but I saw it on your Facebook page that it was here. So thank you for um, inviting comments. Um, my name is Danielle, and I live in the South End. I've been there for almost 10 years. Um, I'm uh, Parking is a bit of a hot button issue for me because I feel like I've paid more than my fair share of penalties and costs associated with um, fees and towing and so on, living in the South End, um, and as a single mom who works nights, odd hours, and um, just coming home and um, you know circling and circling and not being able to find that spot, and um, you know having a baby in the back and you know tr just wanting to get home. Um, so I guess um, I was actually here today <laughs> to contest a ticket. So. Um, I did some years ago advocate for um, Mass Ave to be turned into, um, to allow parking on Mass Ave and um, to be resident parking. And I'm really glad that the city responded and that has happened and that's definitely helped. But I also wanna just encourage the counselors and the decision makers here to be aware of the impacts on low and moderate income residents, um, in particular with increasing fees. Um, Boston is becoming a city of um, greater income disparities, and I'm seeing, you know, a lot of the new residential uh, buildings in my neighborhood and other neighborhoods really being targeted, I feel, to young childless households who can afford a market rate. You know, they want to bike to work or use Uber or use Instacart. Um, you know, it's like, a, I feel like it's an urban planner's kind of dream to have the, envision like this carless society, but I feel like it really doesn't completely square with reality or um, an equitable um, um, uh, system or society for you know varying income levels. Tickets and fees do have a disproportionate in impact on um, low income residents. Um, it can be pretty financially devastating to get towed, so I don't think that enforcement is the only answer. And I also think that it, um, 
the city councilors should be aware that some people really do need a car. Um, and it's not just, I hear, you know, MBTA, why don't we do late night, early morning, that's going to solve it, but not really, because, you know, there's home health care workers that work all over the city, there's people that work in areas that the T doesn't go to, um, there's people with kids that kind of need to have different drop-offs and pickups, um, and you look at the bus routes now, like the number one, the 28, like, you can't even get on there when it's not rush hour. It's so packed. So um, there's different reasons that people have vehicles and to imagine that vehicles are going to go away completely or um, that we can incentivize um, uh, reducing vehicles isn't necessarily a possibility for everyone. Um, so a couple of things, other causes I feel like that are impacting the um, tight parking situation. Um, luxury housing does charge for the parking, and I think that that's one of the things that the um, resident parking fee is intended to kind of incentivize, but I know that, um, I don't know if it's, that fee is enough to really inf make the impact that it's intended to have. Um, and, you know, even in the, those affordable units that are in these luxury buildings, who can afford to pay, you know, a hundred, what they charge for parking in these new luxury units. Like even if you can qualify by income, you're not going to be able to pay for the parking. So it's, that's I think one of the reasons that we have so many unfilled units. And then the last couple of things, um, film permits. I feel like every time there's a movie in South End, it takes up a lot of parking spots. Maybe looking at other opportunity, other areas of parking that are available that are not being used. I know that um, the Carter School allows people to park there until 7 a.m. At the Hurley, it's only until 5 a.m., which is kind of difficult. But there's, you know, Boston Water and Sewer parking lots. There's other lots that are owned by the city. And if overnight parking could be permitted there, I feel like it could ease some of the strain. Um, so I would be in favor, in short, of having some kind of limit, like maybe one permit parking um, uh, permit parking sticker per household and maybe a fee after that. Um, but um, just please think about, you know, even if, even if it's a small amount, it's, it hurts to live in Boston and it's just getting harder. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danielle. Would anyone else like to testify? Okay, then um, I'll just conclude by saying I so appreciate everyone taking the time and all the feedback and um, I know there's a lot of interest in, in giving more feedback out in the neighborhood, so this was purposely just an initial session at City Hall, mostly to hear from our regulators and, and the advocates who have been very plugged in, uh, but that we will take it around the city at night and, and um, outside of City Hall. There's no specific proposal on the table now, so it's not like you should be on edge awaiting a council vote on anything. Um, my goal, I think, will be to understand neighborhood by neighborhood what the situation is as the citywide parking census is being completed and to talk about what does the right package look like in each neighborhood. There will be, there will be some combination of um, what the, you know, any potential fees, number of uh, permits per household, um, potential exemptions, where the revenue might go to, and um, what other benefits come with that. Is it a visitor parking program? Is it something else? So much more to come, but thank you so much for bearing with us and for your time. Um, do you have any final thoughts, Councilor Janey? No, thank you. So this will conclude our hearing on docket number 0173, order for a hearing on Boston's resident parking permit program. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.